I'm Carrie Clay Gilbert. I'm an artist living and working here in Westland out of my home studio. Um, we've been in Westland for, I guess, about, um, this will be our sixth year here. I studied art in high school and college and had grand intentions of growing up and being an artist or a graphic designer. Um, I graduated from college with my digital art degree in, in the Bay Area in 1999, right at like the peak of the initial dot-com boom. Um, and so kind of went down the rabbit hole of doing web design, working in tech, and then later on just kind of kept following that path, kind of in corporate land and kept just following opportunity as it presented itself to me, doing design strategy and user experience design, and eventually ended up in enterprise software sales. And at that point, I kind of went, whoa, <laughs> like, how did I end up here? Back in college, I was like against the man, and now I think I might be the man. <laughs> and so at that point, I just kind of had the wake-up call, realized I hadn't made any art at all, like no doodling, no sketchbook, nothing in years, and just decided to very consciously switch tracks. So when I decided I would get back into art making, I initially gravitated to oil pastels, acrylic paints, just because that those were the media that I tended to use the most back when I was a, a real artist in, in college. And I just, I, I'm the type of person that anytime I see a shiny object, I have to chase it and experiment with something new. So I was just kind of experimenting with things I knew, started playing around with collage. I'm, I'm like a borderline hoarder and I, I hate waste. I hate throwing things away. So collage just kind of started creeping into it just naturally because we'd get packaging from Amazon or whatever. And I, in fact, the, the, some of the seaweed on here is actually the Amazon gift bags. Our kids' grandparents insist on paying the extra $3 to put things in those bags. And so <laughs> I have all these bags. And so I, I just started using collage as an element. Really, it's just a means of using up this stuff that I didn't want to throw away. But then also just started getting fascinated with the different you know, layers of meaning and texture, um, both both literally and metaphorically, that it would add to pieces. And then I did my first art show. I did. I had a booth at the Buckman Art Show in like 2018, and the woman across from me was a printmaker. I had never done printmaking before. I had never thought about it. I, I don't know why. It was just never, it was just never in, in my path. And I got fascinated, and she's like, oh yeah, you should take a class at PNCA. It's great. So I signed up for a workshop, like a, like a community education class at PNCA. I thought, I don't know how I was this far off. I thought it was an introductory printmaking class. It was actually an intensive and like a pretty hardcore process. Everyone else in there had done some printmaking before. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was fascinated by it. Um, so ever since then, I've been trying to take classes at, um, I took another workshop through PNCA and I've taken classes at Portland Community College and I've just kind of been chasing after different techniques ever since. Um, for a long time, I felt like, like there were two bodies of work. There's like my mixed media stuff and my printmaking stuff. And just recently, like just in the last few months, I feel like I'm finally kind of starting to see how those lines might converge. So hopefully some of that's evident here. We'll see, we'll leave that up to the viewers to decide. To be honest, on, on the mixed media side, I don't have any formal training in mixed media per se. Um, I, like I've, I'm trained in drawing and painting and whatever, but adding in the collage elements and the, the mixed media piece, really, like I'm not responding to the way art must be done so much as trying to reuse things as much as possible. And honestly, sometimes, at least in my eyes, it's just kind of a cheat of, oh, that didn't, like, that doesn't quite stand out as much as I wanted it to, so I'll just use an ink marker and fill it in, or that, and actually I'm going to keep pointing to the one behind me. Like, this one, I felt like the fish didn't, which are all cut out collage elements, they didn't quite pop out as much as I wanted them to, and so I went back with um, Prismacolor, with, with colored pencils, and just kind of started coloring on them, not because that was the effect I was going for, but just because like I wanted to be done with it, but I didn't want to get everything out again. And it was, it was just honestly a matter of convenience. I guess the part that I think might be misunderstood, at least from my own artistic philosophy, 
is that there's a right way to do it. Um, and I am a big believer in, and there isn't. Um, you, like, it's the right way if it feels right to you and if it's solving the problem at hand and if it, if it creates results you like. And you know, like rules be damned, I guess. With taking printmaking classes in particular, it's really fascinating because there's, there's so many rules around printmaking. For one thing, it's, it's such a complex process. There's, there's just a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. Um, and so I think especially when you're first learning, it's important to know what those rules are so that you can, you know, can just reduce your margin of error at each of those steps along the way. But at least for me, I, I struggle a lot. Like I have my super messy mixed media stuff where I just kind of throw crap at it and see what works and smush stuff around and, and don't really heed any of the, the artist rules. But then on printmaking, I get really hung up on them. And I think part of it's just because I'm newer to it. So I don't feel as entitled to break those rules yet. But things like how to edition them and how you're supposed to sign them and like how you, I don't know, like you're supposed to like have all these different rules and I, I, keep, I keep wanting to break them. And I was just telling my husband the other day, it's like every time I write a number, like an edition number on a print, I wanna just make like an improper fraction, be like 13 over five or, you know, we're, we're Probably most people wouldn't even notice, but people who know the printmaking rules would either find it amusing or, you know, be like, clearly she doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have a weird relationship with those rules. Like on one hand, I feel like I'm still learning. I still have a lot of imposter syndrome, so it's like I have to follow the rules or, or they'll know that I'm a fake. And on the other hand, I'm like, I'm not... I'm not big on rules in most aspects of my life. <laughs> and, and so I'm trying to figure out like how far I can kind of push that. So depending on the day of the week, I kind of go back and forth between how well behaved I am, I guess. It's funny, I wasn't initially planning on making a whole bunch of new work for this particular exhibit. Um, just to kind of minimize stress. So I was like, I don't have to, I have enough stuff, it'll be fine. And I also just hadn't really been in the studio for several months recently. And then just in the past month, I think just having a looming deadline, like that's always just been a really good motivator for me. And so I hopped to it and I created a ton, like a lot of the prints in here right now are things that were, like I produced in 2023. And since it's February 1, that means very recently. Um, so this one up here is one of, one of that batch. It's part of a, the beginning of a series. You'll see a few different pieces in here that have kind of a similar um, like topographic map motif happening there. This particular one is, it's an intaglio print, which means that you're etching very fine lines in some sort of plate, traditionally copper. This one's actually what's called a shellac plate. It's just a piece of illustration board with shellac plastered on top, so it gives it enough so there again, being able to reuse things or use things that are relatively inexpensive. And so you etch the surface of it so that when you wipe ink over it, the ink gets trapped in the grooves that you just created. And then when you run it through a press with damp paper, the pressure of the press smushes the paper essentially into those grooves and sucks the ink out. Um, so that's kind of the intaglio process in a nutshell. So all of the lines of the topographic map were etched in there and little hiking trails and stuff. It's I wouldn't say use this the next time you go hiking, but it is like traced from an actual topographic map. The empty area in the middle is um, a lake called Pamelia Lake, where we went backpacking a couple of years ago. And then just different techniques to kind of get some of the shading. I did go back in, and depending on your point of view, I either cheated or I'm starting to bring my mixed media background to bear in my printmaking work um, because then all the color is actually watercolor that I apply to it. And that's a technique that I know, I mean, I certainly did not invent it. That's a, a thing that people do. But there's a few, like the pieces in here that use that technique of making an intaglio print and then coloring it with watercolor is kind of my first foray into it, some of the pieces in here. I'm excited about you know, continuing that, that general series of Kind of juxtaposing something found in nature so like this is a pacific rhododendron and juxtaposing that with kind of a man-made view of what nature means to us so that's kind of an ongoing theme in my work so in this case 
trying to kind of map the territory, or you'll see things like seed catalogs and stuff like that. So I'm really fascinated by kind of that boundary between our natural world and how we exist within it, how we try to control it or understand it, and that kind of thing. Another kind of grouping that I just started making that's been kind of fermenting in my brain for a long time, but I just started actually acting on it. Um, so I've, I've been fascinated with all of the, you know, like on the news, you'll hear like it's a super worm moon or like all these different moon names. I've been really curious about those over recent years and so I've been researching kind of like where those different names come from and it turns out like many of them come from um, Native American tribes but there's also like naming conventions for different moons that are like Germanic and Celtic and all these different things and so I've been kind of digging through some of the, the sources of some of these different moon names and I'm hopeful that eventually I'll have like a set of 12 different full moons, one for each month of the year. I'm not sure that any of them are like the official final thing, but I have several um, trial prints uh, in this show here. My first foray into my, my full moons. So I have my, since it's February, I have my snow moon. I have the pink moon, which is named after the pink phlox that traditionally blooms in North America in April. So that's the April full moon. I have a salmon moon, which is one of the names for the July full moon. Oh, the hare moon, um, like rabbit hair, which is um, one of the names for the May full moon. So I'm hoping to kind of keep making moons. <laughs> and you'll see in some of my other pieces too, like the moon has, I've, I'm kind of a dork when it comes to the moon. Like anytime I can see the moon, I will interrupt anyone around and be like, look at the moon, and I get very excited. Um, and so it's, it, is a, it makes a lot of cameo appearances in my work. Absolutely, I, like my entire Instagram feed is, is just artists. A lot of them local to the Portland area. Many of the people I've learned printmaking from are are Portland based. So if people want to get into it, I would definitely recommend taking classes at Portland Community College. Um, Tatiana Simonova, the printmaking instructor there is amazing. I don't know if he's still teaching. Well, I think he is. Paul Maloney, who's the instructor and the master printmaker who did the my, my very first printmaking workshop at PNCA. He's Portland based now. He has a printmaking studio um, in Portland and they put on workshops. Um, so I would, I would also definitely recommend you know, there, there's actually like, quite a printmaking community here in Portland, and that's one of the great things about the medium, is that it, it is such a complex, lengthy, multi-step process that it also just lends itself really well to community. So it's it's not the, you know, the the painter alone in their studio. Um, it's often, although I often am a printmaker alone in my studio at home with my little itty bitty press, but. I would say that like the most amazing printmaking work comes out of studios where you know it requires multiple people even to set the press, and so you just have this community of people making and and revising and improving and, and chatting about their work together. And I wouldn't be able to spend my days making art um, if it weren't for the support of my family. So my husband and my kids are incredibly patient with me on nights like last night where I'm like madly finishing framing things and getting everything just so to set up a new show. Um, they are you know, very patient, fended for themselves meal-wise. Um, yeah, so, and they're just, they're all so supportive, especially my husband of, of me chasing this art dream um, rather late in life. Another one of my hobbies is cooking. I really enjoy cooking, um, which is a large part of why you'll see things like vegetables in some of my pieces as well. I've always had like this, like this, this kind of filing system in my brain of like cooking is like stovetop cooking versus baking where there's a bit more of a gap between throwing the ingredients in and finding the end result. And I'm definitely not as good of a baker as I am a cook where you can taste something and be like, oh, it needs more vinegar. Oh, it needs something sweet, that kind of thing. Um, whereas with it's like, oh, the bread didn't rise and it tastes like crap. Oh, well, right, like there's there's that gap. And I, I 
equate that same distinction to my mixed media and my printmaking work, where on one hand, baking and printmaking drive me nuts because there is that disconnect between here's my idea and here's the process and loving that process, but then the disconnect from the finished product. And it's like, well, if the print comes out of the oven and you don't like it, then it is what it is. And, and part of me, I know I feel like my, in my heart, I'm really more of like a, a messy mixed media artist. I'm more of a messy chef where I can just toss things in it and just adjust as I go. Um, but I really aspire to be the baker or the printmaker who has the patience <laughs> to kind of see that process through and more of that, the scientific mindset. Because then you really have to kind of have a sense of like, okay, here's all my variables. What am I controlling for? What, like, I should really only change one thing this time to really know what made the difference. But I never have that patience. I'm like, but what if I change everything? What if I change the paper and the ink and I adjust the plate and I adjust the pressure? Um, which, of course, will completely prevent me from ever actually really like owning the craft. Um, but I guess that's, that's, I aspire to be a baker and a printmaker, but I'm really more of a cook and a painter. <laughs> that's really interesting that you say that because baking is more scientific. Mm -hmm. And so how you attributed them, I think is spot on. Or you, you have this set of things that interact together, like the, how ink mixes with the medium, which mixes with the, um, or sorry, like the paper, which mixes with the plate. Like right, like there's so many ingredients. How those three things interact? It's very actually scientific. Right. And, then, and you'll um, never know if you change them all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and then mixed media is exactly like cooking. Yep. What would be the Instapot here? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's like, um, uh, Marcel Duchamp, where it's just like, here's yeah. a toilet, it's art. <laughs> here's a man walking down a staircase. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. I haven't figured out what uh, what the beer making equivalent is. Like, I've learned I'm definitely not patient enough for beer making, where it's like, it's not just like set the timer for 45 mm -hmm. minutes. It's like three weeks later, see whether or not this is drinkable. Um, and I haven't quite figured out, but maybe there's like, I've never really done sculpture. There's probably something like that. I should say pottery. Yeah, I yeah. You put it in the kiln. In yep. general, would be because you have your initial setup, and even if you get your clay wrong, that can blow up later. Right, and like literally blow up. Well, yeah, just like beer. Just like beer. <laughs> and you do have to technically rack it, where you put it on racks to be fired, and true. Then glaze it by adding, you know, your special things, yeah. and then you have to put it back in. So yeah. I think you might be right. Yeah. yeah. So I don't really have the patience for that. So. <laughs> 